This is Twit. We haven't spoken much about the Hive ransomware due to me working, as I said earlier, not to make this the ransomware podcast, which it could easily become because there's just so much. Um, you know, just as I don't want it to be the Android malware podcast, but I thought it was worth talking about this one in this case. Um, but this week, I want to talk about the Hive ransomware because the folks behind its design made a significant boo-boo uh, in, in assembling this piece of software. To set the stage, back in mid-December, our original ransomware tracking site, and a great site for security news, Bleeping Computer, introduced Hive by writing. They said, The Hive ransomware gang is more active and aggressive than its leak site shows, with affiliates attacking an average of three companies every day since the operation became known in late June. Okay, so these guys appeared in the, around the middle of last year. Bleeping Computer wrote, security researchers gleaning information straight from Hive's admin panel found that affiliates had breached more than 350 organizations over four months. The gang's leak, the, the gang's data leak site currently lists only 55 companies that did not pay the ransom, suggesting that a large number of Hive ransomware victims chose to pay the ransom. A conservative estimation places Hive ransomware gang's profits into millions of U.S. dollars between October and November alone. Hive ransomware emerged in late June, targeting companies in various sectors. While most of the non-paying victims on their leak site are small to medium-sized businesses, the gang also published files from larger companies with revenues estimated to be in the hundreds of millions. And they finished by saying analysts at cybersecurity company Group IB investigating the Hive ransomware as a service, RAAS, operation, discovered that the group is one of the most aggressive ones. Its affiliates hitting at least 355 companies by October 16th. The first publicly known attack from this gang was on June 23rd against Canadian IT company Altus Group. At that time, it was unclear if Hive was a RAS operation open to other cyber criminals. Things became clear in early September when the group, through a user known as KKK, replied in a thread about reputable <laughs> ransomware programs that they were looking for partners that already had access to company networks. The message also included details about splitting the ransom money 80% to the affiliates, 20% to the developers. The same user also provided technical information about the file encrypting malware in a self-destructing note captured by Group IB researchers. Although KKK did not name the ransomware as a service they were representing, the researchers say that the technical details provided made it clear that the actor was referring to the Hive ransomware. Okay. So Hive is a recently emerged ransomware-as-a-service entity. This makes them one among many. Why are we talking about them today? As I mentioned, the folks behind its design made a mistake. Last Friday, a team of South Korean researchers published an academic paper with the title A Method for Decrypting Data Infected with Hive Ransomware. When the first ransomware emerged, the question of its decryptability, you know, of the ransomware encrypted files was quite naturally the first thing that occurred to anyone, especially those who were untrained <clears throat> in the ways of cryptography. And it may have been that the first the very first ransomware wasn't very well designed, uh, you know, and and because there have been certainly some ransomware decryptors uh, as we know. Uh, that had been created after a reverse engineering of ransomware found that, yeah, sure enough, these guys didn't do it right. Um, but, you know, as for cryptography, as I've often said, this is a solved problem. 
You know, unlike in fiction, you cannot run a bypass or just crack the crypto, you know, because you want to. There's no such thing. You know, trying harder or wanting it more doesn't help. These days, aside from side channel attacks and, you know, key recovery from RAM or like, you know, some way of, of, of subverting, anything that's been properly encrypted will remain encrypted unless and until the proper decryption key is applied. So what did the guys who designed the Hive's crypto do? They made the one classic mistake. They rolled their own crypto. Oh, no. You know. <laughs> you're not allowed. No, no, no. <laughs> it's such a dumb thing to do uh, that the only possible reason I can see for doing so would be speed. Speed does matter for ransomware, mass storage is, after all, massive, and it's only getting more so. So increasing the performance of the bulk file encryption, you know, the, 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 the symmetric cipher speed, would be potentially a big deal. It could mean all the difference between getting everything encrypted before being discovered as opposed to being shut down. And we've seen previous ransomware boasting about its increased performance. In the ransomware-as-a-service world, we're attracting affiliates away from other ransomware service providers could be beneficial. So, being known to have the fastest file encryption in town could be a significant competitive advantage. It is possible to do extremely high-speed ultra secure encryption correctly but they didn't do it right if i were tasked with designing the fastest possible fully secure cipher of course for the purpose of doing good rather than evil i'd use rc4 i've always been a huge fan of rc4 its sheer simplicity and elegance has always appealed to me. And Leo, I recall doing one of my appearances on your call, your call for help show in Toronto uh, on the topic of, IC, of, of RC4. Really? So it's I, pretty you, old. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it, it, it's an early, early Ron Rivest cipher. That's mm. what RC stands for, is Rivest Was it cipher. Four, yes. Okay. Um, it is symmetric. Uh, and, I, and I use that whiteboard that we always got mm -hmm. out for me mm -hmm. in, in, in Toronto in order to draw it. And I mean, it is really simple. Um, it's not complicated, but it has an undeserved bad reputation due to its misuse. It is a bit tricky to use correctly because the first 3K or so bytes that it generates should be discarded. It is a keyed pseudo-random byte generator with a sort of built-in entropy pool. So it makes sense that you'd like you need to, you need to allow time for that that entropy entropy pool to stir itself up and get itself fully randomized. When used as a cipher, it generates a pseudo-random bit stream, which is XORed with plain text to create the cipher text. Its main problem, as I said, is that it does take a while to warm up and begin generating the highest quality bitstream. But once it has, its bitstream is of the highest quality at an incredibly low cost per bit. Not giving it time to warm up is the mistake that the designers of the early Wi-Fi encryption made when they chose RC4. They used the start of the stream which is well known to contain a detectable influence from the key, which is a big no-no. And after mucking up their original implementation, the Wi-Fi Alliance, who keeps demonstrating their lack of genius, chose to abandon RC4 and switch to AES. Not that that was a bad choice. AES is wonderful. I know I'm a big fan of the, of the Rindahl cipher, but it is far slower than RC4 in any event. We've spoken many times about the surprising power of the exclusive OR operation. XOR is simply a conditional bit flipper. 
any bit you XOR with zero remains the same. Any bit you XOR with a one is inverted. And so it's counterintuitive that simply using a pseudo-random bit stream to choose which bits to flip in a plain text could convert it to truly uncrackable ciphertext. But it can, and it does. Uh, we've talked about how tricky it can be to use XOR properly. The similar famous case of that is the one-time pad. If a one-time pad is used exactly one time, as its name urges, simple as it is, it is uncrackable without the key. But if it's ever used a second time, its security completely fails. The XOR, for all its potential power, is similarly brittle. If it's ever possible to know a plain text for the matching cipher text, then those can be XORed to recover the key stream. And a somewhat more convoluted version of that mistake is what the South Korean researchers discovered. So here's a short relevant passage from their 23-page paper where they provide an overview of what they found and did. They wrote, Recently, many ransomware attacks have been found to use a hybrid encryption scheme that encrypts users' files with a symmetric cipher and stores the encryption keys used with an asymmetric cipher. You know, that's the model that we've talked about always. They said most ransomware uses secure algorithms such as AES and RSA for encrypting files. Therefore, if an attacker's private key is not obtained, it is difficult. Well, yeah, they say difficult. We're talking, you know, virtually impossible to decrypt the encrypted files. However, certain ransomware may use a self-developed encryption algorithm when encrypting files. If attackers cryptographically misconfigure the ransomware, which is their polite way of saying, <laughs> if, you know, if they design a bogus uh, encryption system, they said a cryptographic vulnerability can occur. The Hive ransomware encrypts a victim's file using an encryption algorithm developed by the Hive programmers. We analyzed Hive ransomware and discovered the detailed operation process of the Hive ransomware. Hive ransomware uses a hybrid encryption scheme, but uses its own symmetric cipher to encrypt files. We were able to recover the master key for generating the file encryption key without the attacker's private key by using a cryptographic vulnerability identified through analysis. As a result of our experiments, encrypted files were successfully decrypted using the recovered master key based on our mechanism. To the best of our knowledge, they wrote this is the first successful attempt at decrypting the Hive ransomware. So then they have three numbered points. They said we experimentally demonstrated that more than 95% of the keys used for encryption could be recovered using the method we suggested. Our contributions are summarized as follows. So here's the three. First, they said, we identified the way in which Hive ransomware generates and stores a master key for victim files. Hive ransomware generates 10 megabits of random data which it uses as a master key. For each file to be encrypted, one megabit and one kilobit of data are extracted from a specific offset of the master key and used as a key stream. The offset used at this time is stored in the encrypted file name of each file. Using the offset of the key stream stored in the file name, it's possible to extract the key stream used for encryption. Okay, that all makes sense. So basically, these guys, because they're, they're clearly interested in speed, they come up with what they think is a super spiffy, 
fast way of doing encryption. They're going to generate 10 megabits of pseudo-random data one time. Then they're going to take they're, they're going to randomly choose an offset into that and grab one megabit for one purpose and a kilobit for another and use that as the encryption. So they say point two. We analyzed the Hive ransomware to uncover its operation process and a newly developed encryption algorithm process. Hive ransomware encrypts files by XORing the data with a random key stream that is different for each file. Right, right, because they chose a different offset into the single master key stream. They said, we found that this random key stream was sufficiently guessable. And finally, point three, we suggested a method for decrypting encrypted files without the attacker's private key. We found that the Hive ransomware does not use all bytes of the master key encrypted with the public key. Using our proposed method, more than 95% of the master key used for generating the encryption key stream was recovered. Most of the infected files could be recovered by using the recovered master key. We present experimental results for the case of recovering files using our proposed method. Okay, so from this description, we can be pretty certain, as I said, that encryption performance was the goal. Um, the improperly conceived ransomware generated a single static reusable and reused 10 megabit XOR key stream and then, then chose various 1 megabit chunks at a per file offset into that key stream for its encryption. In taking this approach, tempting as it was, they broke the cardinal rule of XOR-based encryption, which is never reuse the same key stream. The bad news is software can be updated, and I'm sure that the Hive ransomware technology will be updated immediately, you know, probably already has been, or they're at work on it. So only those victims who had been encrypted by this first version of the Hive but haven't yet paid the ransom might be helped by this research. Still, this was, a, this was very nice work, and it demonstrates that we should not simply assume that any ransom, that a random ransomware was properly designed to be truly uncrackable. It is definitely worth, you know, going in, reversing the, the, the ransomware, figuring out how it works, and verifying that there isn't a simple way or even of less than simple, like these guys tackled, but still possible way of, of reversing the encryption. So bravo to them. Very cool. And, uh, and, and another couple interesting lessons about XOR. If you use it right, it is the fastest thing there is, but you really need to be careful with the way you use it. Mm-hmm.